Today, we're going to be talking about the 12 signs that might indicate you're dealing with a covert narcissist. So in this video, what I'm going to do is I'm going to share with you 12 signs that I have found that people who may be a covert narcissist in disguise exhibit, but something a little bit interesting. I'm also going to share with you how one sign or one trait can actually, actually reveal other narcissistic traits. It's really quite fabulous. So I've written a bunch of notes here and I want to make sure that we get through all of them. So, um, it's about understanding that covert narcissism is about disguising inner vul vulnerabilities. When you're dealing with an overt narcissist who is grandiose and pompous, we can understand from that perspective when we're looking at someone who is grandiose, oh, they might be, he or she might be grandiose because they want to disguise what's really going on below the veil, which is their incredible insecurities, which represents their fear of appearing vulnerable, right? The false self. But when you're dealing with a covert narcissist, very interesting, they still have this sense of superiority, but it manifests differently. And that's why I think so many of us get hooked. And that's why I think those of us who have been in relationships with covert narcissists, we can be in relationships for years and decades. And only when we take a step back and we observe the traits of the other person and even within ourselves, like how did we show up? It's when we kick ourselves out of the tornado and we can see what was really going on. So I'm talking about perspective. I've used this analogy before. If you're a chicken and you get caught up, let's say in a tornado, you don't know how big the tornado is. You don't even know you're in a tornado. That's what a toxic relationship feels like. When you are in the middle of a toxic relationship, you are so emotionally drawn in. Chaos is looming right? You're walking around on eggshells. You don't know this is a tornado relationship. You're just trying to get through the next moment. You're trying to resolve the current argument. You're trying to make things right in the here and the now. You're not recognizing the fact that you can't get from point A to point B is a sign of covert narcissism. If you are someone who really is looking for resolution, that wasn't even one of the 12 signs that you're dealing with a covert narcissist. So consider that an extra sign. But my point is when you're in the middle of a tornado, you don't know that you're in the middle of a tornado. You don't know how big it is, how wide it is. It's when you get kicked out of the tornado. It's when imagine a chicken gets kicked out of the tornado and the tornado is a mile away that the chicken th can think, wow, that was a big tornado. So I'm talking about perspective. When you're in a relationship with a covert narcissist, you oftentimes don't know it. And it is in hindsight, hindsight that you begin to recognize some of these traits. So if you're struggling with what was that all about? What was this relationship all about? Maybe this list can help you. So covert narcissists still feel superior, but they're smug about it. And they hint at their superiority. They look at someone who's grandiose and they think, it's so much better if you just, you know, you're just sneaky about how smart you are, you know, make people come to you and find ways to get them to praise you covertly in a sneaky way, which is really, really interesting the way covert narcissists operate. So they don't tell you that they're superior, but they will find sneaky ways to hint at this idea that they think that they're smarter than you, that, they think that you are flawed compared to them. And so a covert narcissist is unaffected also by the way their actions impact you. If a covert narcissist wants to dismiss you, they very easily rationalize it. Okay. So let's get to the list. So number one, interesting, a covert narcissist can come off very shy, maybe even intro introverted. But in time, what you will notice is that their shyness can morph into passive aggressive behavior that is tied to them judging you. 
So you meet a covert narcissist. You don't know that they're covert. They are a covert narcissist. They might be very quiet. They might be seem very introverted, but in time, in time, it's not something you notice right away. But if this is your friend, if this is a coworker, if this is a family member, if this is someone you dated or married, what you'll notice is that, Hmm, over time, you know, this shyness wasn't really about humility. It was about them sitting back and judging other people. And eventually what you'll notice is this timid, supposed shy person can be pretty, pretty nasty and pretty passive aggressive. So what you'll notice is that the shyness and the, and the timidness that you notice is a mask for passive aggressiveness. There are a lot of people that are actually shy, that are actually introverted, that are not passive aggressive. They're not secretly judging you. They're not sitting in a room and secretly judging you. They literally feel intimidated by other people and they would never dare, you know, be passive aggressive because there's fear associated with that. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about someone who actually feels like they're better than you. And in time, this shy nature, this timidness reveals passive aggressiveness below the veil. The second thing is that they may use love bombing to idealize you in the beginning and also couple the love bombing with the sob story. So this is to seal the deal. So you're perceived as someone who's amazing. You're so kind. You're so, you're so incredible. They've never felt so connected to anyone like they feel connected to you. And then they weave in, well, my ex was so abusive. I had to walk around on eggshells. She was crazy or he was crazy. And this can only be true if the person is lying. So if the person is saying that, oh, you know, um, you're amazing. You seem so loyal. You'd never cheat on me. Like my ex did the ex never cheated. They cheated, right? So in between all of this love bombing, you will feel idealized with a love, with a sob story. And in time, what you'll notice again is what this will reveal are a bunch of lies. So the idealizing phase, the love bombing phase, coupled with the sob, sob story in time, in retrospect, you go, huh, that sob story wasn't even real. Again, this happens over time. And this happens when you reflect on the behavior or the relationship that you were in. So number three, passive aggression is tied to envy, feeling superior and entitled to be treated with special, um, attention or understandings. It's your job to treat them or mirror back to them that they are special. And if you don't comply, if you fail to hold up the mirror, if you fail to acknowledge their greatness, then you will notice that they can be very passive aggressive, right? So this person, this passive aggressiveness is linked to a deep seated feeling of insecurity and you will note, you will notice it when you don't do what they want you to do. So you will also notice a level of aloofness. They will be dismissive. They will roll their eyes and they will be generally inattentive. You also might notice the passive aggressiveness with other people. So you'll notice that they're passive aggressive with maybe family members. They're passive aggressive with coworkers. You notice that they can be aloof, aloof and dismissive with your friends. And they generally show a lack of interest in what other people are talking about. Unless of course there's a benefit to them. Number four, you notice in hindsight that they stonewalled you. And they may have used faked procrastination. What do I mean by this? So what I mean is that if you're dealing with a covert narcissist, they don't know how to communicate in a healthy way. And let's face it. Most of us are trying to learn how to do that, you know, and most of us are trying to learn how to meet our own needs and to face our own vulnerabilities and to face our own lack and deal with it right? Because we recognize that each of us is a mirror to, to, to one another. And 
that it is our job to shine light on these cracks within us so that we can spiritually evolve, so that we can become the best versions of ourselves. When you're dealing with a narcissist, no bueno. This is not something that they're interested in doing. They need to rely on this false self, this air of superiority, because they do not want to, don't know how to look within and face the, vulnerab face the vulnerabilities, face the in internal conflicts, face the shame. They don't know how to do it. And it's very sad, but it is what it is. And for their friends, for their family, for their lovers, their spouses, whoever, their business partners, it can be absolutely mind bending to be involved with the covert narcissist. But understanding how they operate and why they do what they do gives you a handle on the situation and can better prepare you for how to deal with them in the future. So stonewalling is, this is someone basically who is, you cannot express themselves in a proper way and will find a way to emotionally be aggressive in a covert way through stonewalling and who will then say, oh, well, I'm just a procrastinator. Oh, well, I meant to get it done. This can only be true if the person who is stonewalling you is deliberately lying and using procrastination as an excuse. So again, it's covert. It's relying on this idea that, oh, I'm just a procrastinator, as if it gets them off the hook. And this is to hide the fact that what's really happening is they're stonewalling you. They're making it impossible for you to get the project done. They're making it impossible for you to get the divorce. They're making it impossible for you to finish the house or finish the project you have going on in the house. So they're angry at you. And rather than sit down and say, I'm upset about this thing, they find ways to stonewall you and will blame it on being a procrastinator, which is really hiding a lot of their passive aggressiveness, their feelings of superiority, which are actually linked to feelings of insecurity, which is interesting. So, okay, number five, learn this the hard way. You meet someone who seems timid and shy and boyish and charming. And you know, you meet a female who's like introverted and she's self deprecating. And you think that this is legit. You think that this person is like truly being self -dep deprecating and feels this way about themselves. And you don't realize that this person is actually being self deprecating because they want you to praise them. They want you to be the person that bolsters them, makes them feel good about themselves and feels responsible for making them feel good about themselves. So it's a smoke screen. They're self deprecating, but they're self deprecating because what they're really looking for is an emotional shot in the arm, like a B12 shot. They're looking for you to be that person that is now idealizing them. A covert narcissist needs to feel special and unique just as much as an overt narcissist does, but it's the way they go about gaining admiration, the way they go about gaining praise that's interesting and different than an overt narcissist. When you do not respond the way a covert narcissist expects you to respond, hence boost their ego, make them feel good about them and make them believe that you believe that they're awesome. You can expect a covert narcissist to get very vindictive and very angry and very nasty. This is what they do. And so when you call them out on it and say, wow, that wasn't very nice. They become passive aggressive. They act like you don't know, or they don't know what you're talking about. Right? So they go dumb. Like what? I don't know what you're talking about. So if you don't fall for the way a narcissist uses self deprecating comments to get you to praise them, they can become very angry and very vindictive. And so in hindsight, that's what you'll notice. Wow. When that woman put herself down and I didn't respond, she got a little nasty. When that man said that, you know, he thought he was the dumbest Joe, Joe blow on the block. And I didn't say, no, you're not, you're amazing. You're brilliant. I noticed he stopped talking to me. 
when I didn't encourage that woman who came up to me and told me that, you know, she was so silly and she couldn't remember anything and I really didn't give into it. I noticed that she told my coworker that I did something I didn't do, or I wasn't able to get the file from her that I needed to complete the job. So if you do not praise a covert narcissist, they find ulterior ways, ways to harm you and to get you back. So number six, they're highly sensitive to criticism and will react to even um, a, per a perceived sense of criticism. So even if you're not talking about the covert narcissist in the office, the covert narcissist assumes that you are talking about her or talking about him and they become angry, right? So suddenly now they're sabotaging your desk. Suddenly they're stonewalling a project. Suddenly they're talking about you behind your back. They're giving you the cold shoulder. You were not talking about them, but they assume that you are. And it's because they think, how dare you? You're less than them. There's this idea of superiority when it comes to a office atmosphere and the audacity that you have to talk about them, even when you're not talking about them. So you will be accused, right? So the other traits that show up are passive aggressiveness. They become accusatory. Um, they will blame shift. They will uh, uh, say that you are the reason that they are acting the way that they're acting. They will project onto you. So they're judging you even, even though they justify their anger by thinking and convincing themselves that you're judging them even when you are not, you weren't even saying anything about them. So you will have this sense that you need to walk around on eggshells around this person who will find ways to jack you up if they think you have slighted them in any way, shape or form. So what you will notice is narcissistic rage. You will notice passive aggressiveness. You will notice a sense of entitlement to exploit you because they have perceived that you have criticized them in some way. Number seven, they make a lot of excuses for their behavior and you begin over time to notice a woe is me attitude. You don't notice it in the beginning, especially if you are highly empathic, you know, you have a heart, you want to help people, but you won't notice that this person is really exploiting your empathy. You won't notice that, you know, while you're trying to really chug along and improve yourself, you won't notice that this person really isn't trying to improve themselves. If anything, their life is getting worse and worse and worse and worse and worse. And no matter how often you offer them, um, some advice, they poo poo it. They say to you, you don't know how hard it is. You can say that because you're blah, 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 blah. But I'm me. And this is what's happened to me. And this is why I can't do what you did. Blah, 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 blah. Right. Forget you know, the person who has no legs and no arms that's making it in a wheelchair onto a train every day to go to work. Forget that person who has found a way to make it work. Forget the person who is blind and has found a way to make a living. Forget the person who has come from dire, dire, dire childhood experiences and still has found a way to get up every day and try like the little engine, I think I can, I think I can, I think I can to try to make a shift happen in their life. When you're dealing with a covert narcissist, forget it. They could have the world at their feet. They could have access to tremendous resources, but they won't take them. They won't take advantage of them. They won't put these resources into action. Instead, they rely on you to feel sorry for them. I want you to mirror back this idea that of course your life is so difficult. Of course you're so misunderstood. And this is why you get to sit back and be irresponsible. This is why your anger towards other people is justified. This is why your rage towards that woman is valid. This is why it's okay for you to be an envious, mean spirited, unforgiving, intolerant person because you are so misunderstood. Now, again, you won't see this in, in the beginning, especially if you're, you're highly empathic and you haven't run up against this before. 
it will be kind of mind bending and mind boggling to come out of this and feel like in order to save yourself, you have to excise yourself away from this person who you think, or they have convinced you that if you do excise yourself from their life, they will go down the rabbit hole. So now you feel like you can't let them go. You feel like you're entitled to take care of them. And it's very, very difficult to remove yourself from the life of this type of a covert narcissist, but it must be done. Now, when you no longer mirror back the woe is me and you start holding them accountable, what you might notice again is classic signs of narcissism. The narcissistic injury gets activated. There's vindictiveness, there's passive aggressiveness, there's anger, there's rage, um, there's cyberbullying, there's stalking, and there's triangulation. There's the smear campaign. Suddenly he or she is talking about you in the inner circle and you mean nothing to them. You, that in their head, you have hurt them. They don't understand that they've hurt you. They've drained you. They don't see that. But again, this is not something you see while you're in the middle of it. It'll see it. You're the chicken that got kicked out of the tornado. Thank heaven. And you're putting the pieces of the puzzle together now. So really, really important. Um, so we're up to number eight. So they crave attention through negative circumstances rather than demanding attention boastfully. So this is the person who is always sick. This is the person who is always, no matter what's going on, you know, something's happening in their experience where they're sick, they have financial worries, their kids are sick. They just can't seem to get ahead. You know, you might hear that they're at the salon three days a week, but when you see them, they're playing the pity card. They're playing the sick card and you're like, what's up? Like Mary just told me that she saw you at the, the hairdresser getting your hair done. Oh yeah. I had to go get my hair done because I woke up with such excruciating stomach pain. What you notice is when you're around this person, you feel heavy. Everything is about them. Everything's about how horrible their life is. Everything is tied to some some level of sickness, they're sick, their kid is sick, their husband's sick. And what you will also notice is very, very interesting. When someone in their life gets sick for real, they ain't ha happy about it. They're actually annoyed that their mother got breast cancer. They're annoyed that their sister is sick and, and needed to go into the hospital. They're annoyed that their best friend had an aneurysm. They're annoyed that their husband got cancer and they have to take care of their husband. You will notice passive aggressiveness in this person. You will notice that this person treats the sick person very poorly, angrily. You will notice that this person will have to interject about how they feel, what's going on with their body. So they've found a way to manipulate you emotionally by trying to garner sympathy for them being sick, but they're not really sick. This is just a tool that they figured out works. Okay. And if you're a normal person, you have empathy for someone who has heart problems. You have empathy for someone who has foot problems. You have empathy for someone who has knee problems. You have empathy for someone who can't breathe, right? Don't you, if you're a normal person, you have empathy for other people, you know, and when you're dealing with the covert narcissist who exploits you on this level, it's mind boggling. You can't, you, you, you don't understand it. Like you have them on your head. Oh, this poor person. Oh, this poor person. Oh, this poor person. You're talking about this person. You're making food for them. You're dropping off trays of lasagna for them. You're walking their dog. You're picking their kids up from school. That's the point. This person's getting free trips to Disney world for what? There's nothing wrong, but you're buying it hook, line and sinker. And you don't know you're dealing with the covert narcissist again. This is not something that you notice in the moment. This is something that you notice over time. This is something that you will feel in your body. Like when you're around this person, you see this person at target and you're like, Oh no, you want to run the other way. 
right? Because suddenly they're limping when they see you. Like, I'm not kidding. These people exist. Oh, uh, oh, uh, oh. Uh. Suddenly, suddenly, suddenly his foot hurts or suddenly her heart hurts or suddenly she can't breathe. Now, I'm not mocking people who have legit, legitimate illnesses. I'm not. My God, I have asthma myself, or I used to have asthma. I don't have it anymore since I got divorced. Amen. But we have to be able to discern how we feel around particular people. Legitimately, there are people who are really, really sick and they deserve our compassion. They deserve our kindness. They deserve our consideration. But there's a huge difference between someone who's sick and someone who's not sick and someone who might be mildly sick or someone who might be sick and uses that illness as a reason or a justification to exploit the emotions of other people to garner attention, to garner emotional attention from them, which becomes a source of narcissistic supply when we're dealing with the covert narcissist. Okay. So now when you don't pay attention to the covert narcissist, who, who limps around you or who suddenly can't breathe around you because they are using you this way because they don't want to wash the dishes because they don't want to have to pick up your kids from school or their kids from school. And they have found, figured out that if they play sick, you cater to them. That's the narcissist I'm talking about. Now, when you stop, when you say no bueno, eh, eh, bye Felicia. We're not playing this game anymore. I will take care of my children and you will find a way to take care of your children. I will worry about my health. You worry about your health because the way I see it, I'm hearing from other people that you're just fine and that you are using me and exploiting me for narcissistic supply. When you stop putting that person first, when you stop subjugating your attention in a room to this person, when the conversation turns from this person and you start having conversations with other people and this narcissist is no longer able to manipulate the conversation and get everyone to feel sorry for him or her, that person gets nasty. That person will brood. That person will be slam their fist. That person will want to leave. That person will stonewall you. That person won't talk to you for days, right? In their head, they're angry and you made them angry. They're not self-reflective enough. They're not mature enough to work it out and realize how unfair have I been? How manipulative have I been? Look at what I've done. I'm sitting on the couch while everybody else is washing the dishes. Everybody else is taking care of my kids. Everybody else is doing for me, what I should be doing for myself. And I am manipulating people by making them believe that I am sick in some way. I'm exploiting the emotions of these kind people. How horrible is that? I need to change that. No, a narcissist doesn't do that. A narcissist feels entitled to do that. And so when you are in a relationship, with this person or this person's a family member, it's very difficult to spot. And again, you will notice this by the way that you feel. You will get to a point where you're like, I'm done. This person always makes everything worse. This person is using me and I'm done. I'm just done. When you're done and you cut this person loose and you stop giving this person attention, Again, you're like the chicken that got kicked out of the tornado. Now you're able to see things a lot more clearly. Number nine, they just don't seem to get that other people need consideration as well. So we're talking about a lack of empathy for other people, but you'll, you'll notice that this person is very disinterested in other people's con conversations. You'll notice over time, this person is aloof with you. You'll notice over time, this person uh, stretches and yawns. They got no time for you, right? They're sitting back. They're judging you. They think they're better than you. They have this grandiose sense of self. Like why are they here with you? Like you're so beneath them, right? But remember they won't boast like an overt narcissist. 
they will give you subtle signs that they're better than you, right? They suddenly, if they even want to talk to you, they suddenly tell you what's wrong with you. They tell you what's right with them and they tell you what's wrong with you. And so they lack empathy and true compassion and consideration. You'll notice that you'll tell them a story about your friend who's getting a divorce. Oh, they're disinterested about your friend whose father just died of COVID. Oh, they're not interested. You tell them about the fact that you had a car accident and you know, you broke your foot. They're not all that interested. So you'll notice that there's this general disinterest in what's going on with you, especially or other people, especially when it's emotional. Number 10, Again, you won't notice this right away because they hide it. But in time, in retrospect, you'll remember that they had these microaggressive moments. So they had these outbursts, you know, and it shook you. It made you feel uneasy, like, oh, where did that come from? You know, and they might say, you know, they might slam their fist on the table or they might slam a cabinet or they might go on a rant about how horrible people are, but it's uncharacteristic. In other words, like it doesn't fit this timid, shy, you know, person who appears to be altruistic, like they slip, the mask has slipped. And what you'll notice is in retrospect is like, there were times where this person was, tr uh, was throwing legitimate tantrums. And they were able to justify and what came out of their mouth was she's so stupid. He's so stupid. They treat me poorly. They don't know how great I am. I don't deserve this. So this is idea that people are less than them. And that's the reason that maybe someone called them out, right? So you call out a covert narcissist. Yeah. You're going to tickle their narcissistic injury, funny bone. You're going to tickle it. They're going to feel criticized. They're going to feel threatened. You become a threat. Now what they have to do is this lion within has to awaken and that they have to charge at you so they can protect all of their weaknesses and their vulnerabilities, right? That's what this whole mask is all about. So now when you're dealing with someone now, when that person gets confronted by another person, it's not uncommon for them to have an emotional outburst. The outburst will reveal envy. The outburst will reveal entitlement. The outburst will reveal these other narcissistic traits. And what you will notice in hindsight is that this person got angry when others did not cater to them, when others did not praise them, when others possibly wanted to offer them constructive criticism when they felt slighted. If they got fired, it's not because they weren't performing well. It was because the boss was jealous of them. So these are other forms or signs and symptoms or traits of narcissism that you will notice as a result of an outburst. Number 11, some covert narcissist will exhibit this sign apparently. So they're the person in the room that is self-absorbed. They might be really decked out. They might, they might be giving you the sense that they think who they are opposed to the timid and shy, um, character trait of a covert narcissist. This is someone who is sitting back in a room full of others and really thinks he or she is better than everyone. So when you notice what they're wearing, they, now, this is not uncommon for a narcissistic male or narcissistic female. They really utilize, they go over the top when it comes to the way that they dress. They go over the top, um, with their sexuality. Um, they, they want to manipulate things that are easy, jewelry, uh, the makeup, the way that they dress, um, the things that they, the cars that they drive. So they go over the top with, with this sense of superiority with things that are easily manipulated like clothing, for instance, right? Not to say that people that like to dress well and care about, care about the way that they look are covert narcissists or narcissists. No, that's not what I'm saying. 
If you're not someone who is using your dress because you think you're better than everyone else, or you're not sitting, you don't care what other people are wearing, and you're not looking at other people going, look at that silly peon over there, look at the way she's dressed, and look at me, or look at that guy's shoes, and look at that guy's hair, and look at me. If you're not doing that, you're not a narcissist. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about the sullen narcissist that sits in a corner, has completely decked, him out, decked himself out, and is secretly and quietly judging every person in the room. That's what they do. This helps them feel better than everyone else. This is masking a conflict within, the shadows within, the vulnerabilities within that a narcissist is struggling, struggling with. No, I'm not this inferior person. I'm this amazing person. It's an ongoing conflict that a narcissist uh, is unable to resolve because they don't look within, right? They rely on all of these ego defense mechanisms. So you'll notice this air of self-absorption with this, this air of importance. So in their head, they're really important. In their head, they have really important jobs. In their head, they're really superior intellectually. In their head, their job is so much more important than your job. In their head, you know, what they do with their life is so much more valuable than what you're doing with your life. That's what's going on in their head. And so they're self-absorbed with this sense of importance for self. So they're judging you. This will also, the other narcissistic traits that this will eventually show and reveal is a lack of empathy for other people, right? So there's a lack of empathy for you. There's a lack of compassion for you. There's a general lack of interest in what you're really going on. And anything that you reveal to this person, your vulnerabilities, all they're really saying is, is when you reveal your vulnerabilities in their head is, it's just justifying why they're better and smarter and more important than you. But of course you don't realize this. In time, you look back and you think, wow, you know, she was pretty smug. Or wow, he was pretty smug. Or wow, he was pretty arrogant, no? You know, or wow, she was a little self-righteous. Or wow, you know, she really was condescending. And, and wow, you know, when my mother started to talk about this thing, you know, she just got up and left the room. Or when so-and-so started talking about her sick dog, you know, he just yawned, rolled his eyes and was like, what am I doing here? This is something that you will notice over time and in hindsight. So number 12, so there's an inability to genuinely connect to this person on a heart level. You just, you just can't do it. You're trying like you're really trying, but you can't get an emotional connection with this person. You just can't read them. You just can't really feel like you're seen by them because you're not, because they can't see you, right? They are self-absorbed, but the feeling that you'll get is that you can't connect to this person. You'll notice that this person has a string of relationships and it's always the other person's fault for why the relationship ended. Ended. So this inability to connect with your friend or this inability to connect with your husband or your wife, your partner, your business partner, your coworker, whatever, over time, what you'll notice is that it reveals aloofness. It reveals a dismissive nature. It reveals an air of superiority over you. You'll notice over time that this narcissist wanted people around that could benefit their career. This narcissist preferred to be around people of a that maybe offered them a sense of prestige. Even if he or she didn't like this group of people, the narcissist would come alive when he or she was around people that could do something for them and do something for their career. But over time, you'll notice that it wasn't real. It never felt real. You were never able to really, really reach out and touch them. And that's because you couldn't because the narcissism is like a plane of glass. Like you see them, you can hear them, but you really can't touch them. And they are literally sealed within that glass within themselves. They just don't know it. Now with, um, again, so what this will, will reveal over time is that they were smug. They, they were arrogant. They were self-righteous. Um, they had a, a sense of superiority and they had, this was masking a deep sense of insecurity and 
really a bunch of vulnerabilities that the narcissist just cannot work out in their head. And so what they do is they mask those vulnerabilities and they mask those insecurities with all of these covert narcissistic traits. I really hope that this ses session has been beneficial. If you have been caught in the grips of a narcissist, no bueno, it's not fun, but there is hope. You just have to continue to educate yourself. Find a support group online or in your area. Check out my support group online. We'd be more than happy to accept you. Just answer a few questions and we'll accept you into the group. If you are struggling with codependency, if you lack a sense of self, if you tend to manifest narcissistic relationships, if you tend to not know how to set a boundary with someone who's pushing you too far, check out my on-demand 12-week breakthrough coaching program. It can get to the root source and the root reason for why you are codependent and teach you the valuable skills that we all need to self-actualize, to really heal the inner child so that we're not repeating these patterns from the past. And if you'd like to listen to one of my books for free, all you have to do is click one of the links in the description box. If you want to learn more about me, just go to www.lisaaromano.com. Namaste everybody until next time. And when you're out and about, don't ever forget to think. If you Bye love this content, check out the next video and don't forget to click the link below so you can take the codependency quiz. Many of us associate crazy making behavior with covert narcissists or people with high narcissistic traits. And undoubtedly, somebody who has high narcissistic traits, who is unable to empathize, who plays the perpetual victim, who is charismatic and love bombs you when you first meet them, who, you know, double talks is definitely going to be going to exhibit crazy making behavior.